Hello and welcome to Eastern Roman History. In my two previous videos about daily life in the Eastern Roman Empire, I spoke about how people went about their daily business. This was in the context of late antiquity in the Dark Ages, as the empire recovered from the struggles of the 7th century and reached a new golden age in the 9th, 10th and 11th centuries, there were quite a few changes in daily life. A major development of this period was the rise of the great monasteries that would characterise the religious life of the empire. The most famous are the Byzantine monasteries of Mount Athos, the so-called Holy Mountain which can still be visited today. It also highlights an area hitherto left undiscussed, the high concepts of Byzantine daily life. I would like to thank my generous patrons for their support, and if you enjoy this video, please like and subscribe for more content about the late Roman and Byzantine Empire. Stay notified using the bell, and now let us continue. Most Byzantines had a vague understanding of the passage of time. Timekeeping in the Eastern Roman Empire was based upon the indiction cycle, the Roman tax cycle that reset every 15 years. Each indiction began on the Roman New Year, the 1st of September. Most Byzantines were content to use the indiction cycle for all of their dating, and was even enshrined in law by Justinian I. A date such as Sunday the 13th of August, in the year of the 13th indiction, would be all the dating that an ordinary Eastern Roman would use. Anyone using a date such as this had to use their own knowledge of the person or the event to attempt to compute which indiction cycle was actually meant. The indiction cycle was enough for the average Eastern Roman citizen, However, precise dating was employed by many authors and writers as a way of keeping time. There were several annual dating systems used within the empire. The Roman government, in antiquity, dated the year by consulships. By the Macedonian era, the consular year was defunct. The regnal year was preferred, but relied on the individual knowing exactly the day, month, and year of that emperor's accession, which was not always accurate. The Syrians used the Seleucid era dating system, which began on the 1st of October, 312 BC. At Antioch, they used their own dating system that started in 49 BC. The year of the world, Annus Mundi, was not universally used by the Romans, but became the most common in this period. It was based on how old the world was since the creation, which was reckoned at about 6,000 years, but its computation could change significantly between authors. In this period, the form of history that became the most popular and well-preserved was the Universal Chronicle. The concept of a universal history was not new. The ancient Greeks, such as Diodorus of Sicily and Ephorus the Elder, composed notable universal histories. This type of history was also composed by the Jews, Josephus's Jewish antiquities being a prime example of a universal history from a Jewish perspective. The earliest surviving Christian world chronicle we possess was written by John Malalas, and there are much earlier ones dating back to the late 2nd century. The Byzantine universal history was a complete record of all human history from the creation to the present. Most Byzantines use this type of history book to inform them about the past rather than the more classical form of history, and was very popular. For some examples of universal chronicles from this period, there are George Synkelos and Theophanes, George the Monk, Simeon the Logotheti, Pseudo-Simeon, George Kedronos, the 10th century great chronographer, and Peter of Alexandria. In terms of distribution, if we take one example of the surviving manuscripts of Leo the Deacon, who wrote a classic style history of the emperors Romanus II, Nicephorus II, John I, and the beginning of Basil II's reign, only one manuscript survives. 
which was created in the 12th century. In contrast, the Chronicle of Simeon the Logofeti, which was also composed in the 10th century, has 29 surviving manuscripts of version A, 8 copies of version B, as well as 2 Slavonic translations of the former. So, what was so appealing about this Christian universal chronicle? Firstly, being an entire textbook of the past, a reader only needed to read one of these chronicles to have a general understanding of all of the important events in history from a Christian and Roman point of view. These chronicles were also written for a much wider audience and often used much simpler language than classical histories. The general story of our Byzantine chronicle would start with the events of the Bible, including the Antediluvian Age, but would be supplemented with events or stories from the great empires of antiquity, the Assyrian Empire, Pharaonic Egypt, Ancient Greece, and pagan Roman history. Amongst this chronological framework would be the author's attempt to explain the workings of divine providence during the course of history. There were explanations of many of the facets of the pre-Christian era. The pagan gods, such as Zeus and Ares, were named after the planets and not the other way around. The gods and goddesses themselves were in fact mortal men. The reason why Assyria had a story about the flood was because their civilization actually predated the flood. Their last antediluvian king, known as Zisuthrus, was in fact Noah himself, and that the Chaldeans and Assyrians were in fact Jews. These are some of the many ways Christian authors explained the relation of biblical, non-biblical, and natural history. The Eastern Romans were, on the whole, Christians of one stripe or another. They saw God and the kingdom of heaven as a model for the emperor and his imperial court at Constantinople, or vice versa. The similarity between the kingdom of God and the Roman Empire was something all Eastern Romans took for granted. A chamberlain of Emperor Alexander described the court of heaven in a vision, recorded in the Synaxarium Ecclesiae Constantinopolitanae. We went on to a city of indescribable beauty. Its walls were built of twelve courses, each of a different precious stone and its gates were of gold and silver. Within the gates we found a golden pavement, golden houses, golden seats. The city was filled with a strange light and a sweet smell, but as we traversed it we did not encounter a single man or beast or bird. At the edge of the town we came to a wonderful palace, and we encountered a hall as broad as a stone's throw, and one end of it To the other stretched a table of porphyry, round which many guests were reclining. A spiral staircase situated at one end of the hall led to an internal balcony. Two eunuchs, resplendent as lightning, peered on this balcony, and they said to my companions, Let him also recline at the table. I was shown a place while the eunuchs departed to another chamber that appeared to be beyond the balcony, and they absented themselves for several hours. At length the eunuchs returned, and they said to the apostles, Take him back, since his spiritual children are in great mourning for him. The emperor has consented that he should return to the monastic life. We passed seven lakes in which multitudes of sinners were being tormented. One was filled with darkness, another with fire, another with an evil-smelling mist, another with worms, and so forth. Soon we encountered Abraham, who gave us a draught of sweet wine and a golden cup. Then we returned to the outer gate. This idea of what the heavenly court looked like is reiterated by John Muropos, as preserved in his poem delivered at the court of Michael IV in the 1030s. Muropos says how he feared being turned away by the emperor's winged angels at the gates of the palace, and if he overcame the gates and drew close to Michael's throne, would he not be struck by the flaming sword of the cherubim? 
He also suggested that Christ himself might be present in the court because, just as he visited the three Hebrews in the furnace in the book of Daniel, he could be present with the Emperor Michael, his Empress Zoe, and her sister Theodora. Angels in Byzantine thought were God's army, messengers, and chamberlains. On earth they performed functions such as protecting people, churches, and towns. The Eastern Romans knew about the seraphim and the cherubim, as they are described in Isaiah and Ezekiel. The seraphim are famously depicted circling the inner dome of the Hagia Sophia. The middle-ranking angels, the thrones, powers, dominions, and principalities were less well understood. Of the archangels, only Michael and Gabriel received popular devotion. Archangel Raphael and Uriel were rarely invoked. Angels, to the Eastern Roman mind, were not considered purely spirits in nature, but had a thin layer of matter that allowed them to be seen by mortals. A much more widely accepted view was that angels were not made of matter, but could assume a bodily form. This meant they could be represented in art. When angels did appear, they took the form of a youthful eunuch. They are often described as being tall, bright, clad in white and golden robes, or dressed as a prepositus. Their eunuch forms were chosen because angels were sexless and were God's attendants, much like how a eunuch was an attendant of the emperor and could take up arms against their master's enemies. However, the Byzantines never worked out a consistent and generally accepted system of angelology, so many aspects would be particular to each place. To an Eastern Roman, they lived in a world of the visible and the invisible. Most people were not even aware of the battle between good and evil that was taking place around them, but it was the role of holy men and women to protect them. When a person died, demons would flock to them to try and possess their body. The demons were quite literally prevented from doing so by their own guardian angel. Once a person's soul was detached from their body, it had to travel through 21 toll booths, which were manned by demons. A 10th century work lists these toll booths as slander, abuse, envy, falsehood, wrath, pride, inane speech, including laughter, jokes, obscenities, provocations and lewd songs, usury and deceit, despondency and vanity, avarice, drunkenness, remembrance of evil, sorcery and magic, gluttony, idolatry and heresy, homosexuality, adultery, murder, theft, fornication and callousness. These demons would examine a person's earthly deeds using extensive codices containing a record of every single transgression with a date and witnesses. The only way to remove an entry was to have confessed it as a sin and paid penance. The soul would pay a toll calculated in good acts or be taken. St. Simeon of Emesa once prayed for his mother's soul during Telonia, saying, Grant her, O Lord, an escort of angels to protect her soul from the evil spirits and pitiless beasts of the air who attempt to swallow all that go by. However, these toll houses or telonia were never officially endorsed by the Orthodox Church. A soul in the Byzantine mind was sorted into a class and had to await the final judgment. The devil, in Byzantine culture, could take several forms. He often appeared as a serpent, a black dog, an ape, a crow or a mouse. If he took human form, he would appear as a short negro, an old woman or an Arabian merchant. The devil was a coward, a liar, and had a foul smell. His favourite tactic was to inspire dirty thoughts in in people's minds or prey on boredom. If he could not tempt people this way, 
then he could terrify people as a wild beast or a giant and sometimes inflict violence upon people. In the Byzantine mind, the devil's favourite target were holy men because he envied them. The holier they were, the more envious he was of them. Holy men possessed the gift of discernment of spirits, which a holy man could use to smoke out the devil and ward him away by making the sign of the cross, or by reciting Psalm 68. Let God arise, let his enemies be scattered, let them also that hate him flee before him. A pillar of Eastern Roman thought that was present in many people's minds was the absolute certainty that the world would end. Today, we all know that the world will cease to be many billions of years in the future. The Eastern Romans knew this too, but their version was the apocalypse as described in the Bible. The world would end with Judgment Day and the Second Coming of Christ. The Byzantines understood the apocalypse as described by Christ himself in the Synoptic Apocalypse in Matthew chapter 24, Mark chapter 13, and Luke chapter 21. First there would be warfare between kingdoms and nations, famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. This series of calamities would herald the beginning of sorrows. There would be great distress, and the abomination foretold by the prophet Daniel would stand in the holy place. The sun and the moon would then lose their light. Then the stars would fall from the heavens, and the Son of Man would appear in the clouds with all his might and awe. The time of the second coming was unknown to all, except by God the Father alone. All Eastern Romans understood that their generation might be the last. Several parts of the Bible stood out to the Eastern Romans and were taken very seriously in regards to the Apocalypse. John 1, chapter 2, verse 18, pontificating about the Antichrist was greatly significant. Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that the Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. As the Byzantines understood it, the Antichrist was, through the prophet Daniel, the man of sin and the son of perdition. Through the teachings of St. Paul, the Antichrist was to appear in the time of falling away, before the second coming. The Antichrist would sit in the temple of God, posing as God, and work miracles, but the true God would destroy the Antichrist. The Antichrist was believed by the Byzantines to belong to the tribe of Dan, and would be resisted by Elijah and or Enoch whom the Antichrist would kill and reign for three and a half years before God's triumph. There was a strong belief in the four kingdoms or beasts of the prophet Daniel. The fourth kingdom, or beast, that was made of iron and would devour the world and break it to pieces, was identified by the Romans as the Roman Empire itself, although the author of Daniel meant for it to be the Seleucid Empire. After the reign of the fourth kingdom, or beast, was Judgment Day. The Eastern Romans also associated God from Magog in Ezekiel chapters 38 to 39, where the northern nations would do battle with Israel in the last days, with the little season of Satan being unleashed from his prison and set loose in Revelations chapter 20 verse 8. The later Byzantines also associated Gog who was described as the Prince of Rose in the Septuagint with the Russians, since the Byzantines in Greek called the Russians Rose. The Eastern Romans, with a foundation in the old pagan belief in Rome's eternity, believed that the Roman Empire would last until the Apocalypse, and, being the Fourth Kingdom, was the force in the world that staved off the advent of the Antichrist. Constantinople was considered the centre of the universal stage. This unwavering belief in the imminent nature of the apocalypse 
can also be seen during the Byzantine Golden Age. Here the deacon is a good example. Many extraordinary and unusual events have occurred in the course of my lifetime. Fearsome sights have appeared in the sky. Unbelievable earthquakes have occurred. Thunderbolts have struck and torrential rains have poured down. Wars have broken out and armies have overrun many parts of the inhabited world. Cities and whole regions have moved elsewhere. So that many people believe that life is now undergoing a transformation and that the expected second coming of the Saviour and God is near, at the very gates. What the Byzantines expected to happen during the Second Coming is described by the 10th century life of Basil the Younger. At the appropriate time, an aperture will have appeared in the heavens and a column of fire would connect with the earth. An angel will have been sent to Satan and reading a scroll with a message from God shall have ended his three-year reign on earth, wipe clean all of the evil and corruption he caused and be banished back to hell. Then, the Archangel Michael and twelve other angels will have sounded their trumpets and the dead will have risen. Everyone would look identical to each other, like featureless adults. The virtuous would be marked out by their radiance and a list of their good deeds written on their brows. Sinners would be covered in filth, mud, ash and leprous scales, based upon their sins. Similarly, with their vices inscribed on their brows. Some would look like animals and represented the idolaters who never knew of Christ or Moses. The sinners would be joined by the heretics. Once risen, the throne of God would appear with a giant cross. Groups of angels would move to the four cardinal points and the four corners of the world. Christ would then appear in a cloud and the righteous would sprout wings and fly to meet him. Christ would then sit on his throne and rejuvenate the earth and restore the firmament. The stars would be replaced by the saints, the sun by Christ himself. The ocean would be replaced by a fiery river and the angels would herd the idolaters into the river of fire. Those left to be judged were the Israelites, the Christians and those pagans that did not worship idols. The virtuous would be placed to Christ's right and the sinners to his left. Christ would then lead all the righteous to the heavenly city. At the front was the Virgin Mary and John the Baptist. The sinners were separated into periods and categories. The Byzantines believed the largest group was the profligate, Asotoi. These had a number of categories including the envious, pederasts, magicians, the indifferent, lazy, avaricious and disobedient monks, drunkards, thieves, heretics and Jews from after the incarnation of Christ and all these would be damned. The Virgin Mary was meant to intervene and save two medium-sized groups, unbaptized children of Christians and also people who were determined to be neither good nor bad and they would live in the suburbs. The righteous would be invested in a huge church and a ceremony conducted by Christ in the style of a Byzantine emperor, conferring dignities to his officials. Christ, the Virgin Mary, John the Baptist, and various saints would live in an upper quarter of the city. Then the kingdom of heaven would reign. If you liked this video, then don't forget to like and subscribe for more history about the Eastern Roman Empire. I have attempted to condense a lot of high concept thoughts as best as I can, and I hope you enjoy it, and forgive me for any errors I have made. Thank you very much to my generous patrons, and this has been Eastern Roman History.